Got it. All right. We'll talk today about Commodore Power Supplies. Um, as you guys probably know, Commodore Power Supplies are kind of hard to find. Okay. <laughs> and so, as far as that goes, it's very difficult to obtain, obviously, new ones. Um, and the existing ones that are out there are starting to fail. They're linear power supplies, and the Commodore 64 and 128 power supply have both a 64, or sorry, a plus 5 volt DC mode, as well as a 9 volt AC mode. <clears throat> and so, both of those trans, both of those power supply voltages have to be available on the Commodore 64 in order to allow the Commodore 64 to operate. The 5 volt is needed for uh, the logic scenario and the 9 volt AC is used both as an unregulated, unregulated uh, output on the user port as well as it's used to create a DC voltage for the SID chip, 9 volt or 12 volt depending on which of the, the SID chip voltage, or versions you have. The 128 also uses the same voltages for the same reasons. It uses it for the time of day clock. That's right. It does use zero crossing for the zero crossing of the 60 hertz or 50 hertz time frame for the uh, time of day clock. So to get the 60 hertz or 50 hertz value it necessary to set the time. So as a result, um, there's been talk over the years about building a replacement power supply. The problem is the 9 volt. Right? If you was just a 5 volt power supply, there's a, there are a dime a dozen, right? Any wattage, any amperage you want, easy, right? 9 volt is where the problem is. Now there's been a number of attempts over the years to do a, like take a wall wart, a uh, 9 volt AC or a 5 volt and package them in the same box, or maybe a variation on that, it makes a professional box and whatnot. Um, fundamentally though, I found that particular, found that particular solution a little lacking. In my opinion, the best solution would be to use a switch mode power supply, a nice brand new energy efficient switch mode power supply to power the C64. The problem is, the problem is that the switch mode power supply is not um, going to provide AC voltage, it's only going to provide DC. That's what switch mode power supplies do. So today I'm going to talk to you about a prototype power supply that um, we helped, or that actually Bill Hurd, and those who, who knows who Bill Hurd is? Okay, so obviously <laughs> Bill of Commodore fame, um, and I have been working on this together, primarily Bill, and I've been providing a little bit of uh, additional help on the side, as it were, with someone like Bill. Um, he's not here today, so I'm going to talk about the power supply, and then obviously if questions you can comment and ask uh, myself, and I can direct those questions to Bill, or I can hopefully answer some of them myself. <clears throat> so I've got some paper up here, and it looks like my my uh, backing is is a little bit lacking here, so I'm going to try and fix that temporarily here. Um, I brought this up here because I'm going to try to draw out what's going on in the power supply that I've designed. And so here is a prototype version of that power supply right here. Um, so everybody can see it doesn't look like much, but there's two main features here. It takes five volts on the input, which is what these two pins are right up at the top. And then you see a place for a, for a uh, integrated circuit. Um, and then you see a transformer on the bottom end. And so the idea is here is to use a switch mode power supply and create 9 volts suitable to run the Commodore 64. So there's a couple things that have to be done. One thing is you have to create an isolated 9 volt power supply from the 5 volts. You cannot just create 9 volts from the 5 volts and then feed it in because if you do that then the switch on the counter 64 and 128 only shuts off one half of the power supply and so if you have an AC voltage then every other half you're driving voltage into the system and it'll back feed through and so that's a no-no. So you've seen some plans online that create like a 9 volt or 10 volt type of pseudo AC power supply out of a, out of a, a IBM PC uh, uh, ATX or AT power supply um, unit and then they'll say something like make sure you don't shut this off at the computer you got to shut it off at the, the power supply you got to have a power strip and shut it off there well the reason is because it's not isolated okay so what I'm going to talk to you today there's two things one is creating isolation and the other one is creating a AC waveform out of DC so the heart of creating an AC waveform out of DC is to do a technique called pulse width modulation and so I've got a thing up here on the screen um, tells a little bit. You can see right here on this pulse, width, pulse on this trace right here, you've got 
a voltage at zero and you've got a voltage, you know, whatever it is. In our case, it's five volts right here. But if you look at the width of all of these things right here, you'll see that they're very wide at this point, and then they get very narrow here, and then they get very wide again. Everybody notice that? Okay. Well, what happens is, if you deliver this output, you're delivering zero and you're delivering five volts, but if you deliver that output to a transistor, let's say, in, in our case, it's a, a FET, a field effect, field effect transistor. If you deliver this information to a field effect transistor, then if you then smooth that information, smooth that data through a, a capacitor, what's, what happens is that pulse width modulation starts to look like a, um, let me see where the thing right here is. The output after the capacitor starts to look like a sine wave. The reason is, is because the capacitor tries to charge up, but there's not much voltage, so then it quits. And then the next time you do a pulse width, it has a little bit longer time to charge up. And then, and you got to remember, capacitors don't, they try to resist voltage change, right? So they don't want to have, they have to, they have to get up to a certain charge. So by limiting the amount of time that you charge the capacitor each time, then that's how you get the, 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 the variable slope like this. So simply by choosing the width at certain times, so what you do here is you say this cycle time, the amount of cycles in here is, let's say, 100. So there's 100 cycles here. And then by varying the on time for, one, for each one of those 100 cycles, you can create the sine wave, or you can create any wave. You can create triangle, you can create you know, whatever kind of a complex waveform you want to create just by doing pulse width modulation. Right? So that's what, that's what, that's the technique that, that Bill, uh, uh, you know, this idea of creating a 9 volt power supply from, uh, from 5 volts um, was Bill's idea in order, to, in order to get away from the linear power supply. And then one of the things I suggested is let's try an option that does pulse width, mod pulse width uh, modulation in order to create more of an accurate sine wave, right? The other thing you have to contend with in a power supply is that some power supplies are for the non-US market, which are 50 hertz, whereas power supplies for the US market are 60 hertz. So whatever you do for your cycle here, you need to make sure that you have both versions. You have a 60 cycle version and you have a 50 cycle version, right? Because otherwise the time of day clock will be off for, for one thing, right? So the circuit that was created for this power supply, this one that you see right here, you'll see there are two large, whoops, there are two large transistors right there, right here. If you could see beyond the, um, if I pull the, the uh, wiring down, you see there's two large, they're called field effect transistors right here. Okay, and so what we're doing is we've created a transformer, and so I'm gonna draw this transformer up here. So what we've created is we have five volts here, and we've brought the five volts down, and we have taken this five volts, and we put it into the middle of um, yeah, we've taken and put it into the middle of a transformer that has uh, has three wind or has two windings and has what they call a center tap. Okay, so you're putting you're putting uh, five volts right into the middle of this, and then what we're doing is we are putting one of these FETs, and I'm just going to draw it out here as a FET. We're going to put the FET right here and we're going to go to ground or we're going to go to another FET and we're going to go to ground. And there's a special uh, diagram for the FET, but I, I'm not going to draw because it it's kind of complicated and I'm not sure it's going to make a whole lot of sense, but everybody understands this is just a coil of wire. So the FET, the transistor has a what they call a gate, so you can turn it on or off, right? So when you turn this particular trans, this is basically a switch, and so when you turn this switch on, then you're driving five volts through here. When you turn this one on, you're driving five volts through here in the opposite direction, right? So you got one and the other. And then on the other side, you have another, you have another coil on the other side. That's your transformer, okay? So this creates your isolation <clears throat> so that you don't have to worry about the 9 volt and the 5 volt being coupled in any way. And then on top of that, by doing this 5 volt, flipping these around, so you have 5 volts and you have 5 volts, 
the, this part of the winding is generating 10 volts peak to peak because it's going 5 volts to 0 on the one half and then 5 volts to 0 the other way around. So it's doing 10 volts if you go from one end to the other, right? So then you have 10 volts. But 10 volts isn't quite enough because 9 volt AC is a basically, it's approximately 12 volt peak to peak. So 24 volts, so to speak, or is 12 volt, yes, 12 volt peak to peak. Um, 9 volt AC though is, is the, way, the way AC voltages are done is if you have a, make sure I got, yep. So if you have a sine wave like this, this is considered, sorry, right, right here is considered 9 volt and this is 12 the top that it gets. When it says 9 volt, so you'll sometimes see it RMS says value. RMS, which is root mean square, which says effectively this sine wave, if you trans, if you convert it into a DC voltage, it would be 9 volts of DC. But the actual voltage actually goes up beyond 9 volts. It goes up to about 12.73 volts. And it also goes down to negative 12.73 volts. So you need to create a swing that's approximately 25 volts. So 10 is not quite enough. So what, what you do in a, in a transformer is you can get more voltage out of the other side of a transformer by putting more windings in. So if you put double the windings on one side as the other, then you end up with twice the voltage on the other side. So that's what that transformer that you saw, that's what it does. It takes the 10 volts here and turns it into 25 volts approximately over here. It's actually like 28 volts over here. And so then that's used as the 9 volts, right? <clears throat> Then, what's, then the big trick is turning these on or off at a certain amount of time. And so the contribution that I provided to the, to the prototype is I created a microcontroller design. So there's a chip over here, just a really simple chip. And it has, so it has five volts, and it has ground, and then it has one pin that you can short to ground and that's 50 or 60 hertz, right? So by putting, that, by, by putting that jumper on or turning it off, it changes the timing to go from 50 hertz or 60 hertz. And the other thing, there's another pin over here that says, um, this is right here, it's, it's PWM or another solution which is uh, what some of the original prototypes use which is called chopper. So a chopper signal is just a really simple signal that just is like this. Whoops. It's just it's just like that. It's just all the way high, all the way low, and whatnot. The key though is when you send that kind of transmission through a uh, through a transformer, as you've indicated, it rubs off the edges, right? So it that's kind of smooths the, that's out that flywheel. Yeah. yeah. So what if you send a, if you send this kind of tra if you send this kind of waveform through the through the transformer? So if you send if you send this through the waveform or through the transformer on the other side, you end up with like it kind of rounds off the edges, right? And so it kind of approximates a uh, a, a sine wave. It's not quite a sine wave, but it approximates a sine wave. But we did both of these because we wanted to make sure. One of the big things we were concerned about is noise on the SID and video artifacts. We right? want to make sure that everything is clean as you get to the video side and everything's clean as you get to the SID side. You don't want any coupling or anything like that. The problem with the chopper circuit is it's a square wave. Square waves end up with a lot of harmonics and so there can be a problem there. So one of the other things this chip does is it will allow you to create either one. So you can create a pulse width modified output. So the pulse width output then sends these little itty bitty, you know, transact or a little bit uh, of pulse all the time through here or the chopper just sends positive through one side and uh, the other side is not, is not open. So it's one of the, one of the transistors is on at, every, at any time, but, but neither are both, both transistors are never on at the same time, right? You're either doing one side of this or you're doing the other side, but you never have both transistors on at the same time. Do you control, control that with the same signal? Do you like flop it or something like that? No, or? you do, no, it's, it, there's two signals out of here. So one signal is, is uh, FET1, and the other one is FET2. This so is for simplicity? No yeah, it's for simplicity. Yeah. yeah. The, I, there's also, in the, in the final version of the, of the uh, hardware, Bill's planning to put a fail set, or you know, put some, uh, um, basically some uh, 
fuse type functionality in there so that in the event that the Overload, yeah, yeah it overloads or the CPU gets in a bad state or whatever then the system will fail gracefully you know and that's that's really the that's really the beauty that Bill provides to this project because Bill understands all the different failure modes when he was working on the 128 I mean they always designed for the worst common denominator and so that's one of the things where this really has to you know what would be the worst thing that could happen and will the circuit deal with that right and needs to gracefully deal with that so right now we're at stage of a prototype where we've got both pulse width modification or pulse width modulation as an option as well as uh, just a standard square wave type of operation and then of course the microcontroller is doing all the timing so you get it you get an exact 50 Hertz or exact 60 Hertz and then of course it's driven from just a standard 5 volt power supply so here I you know here I have a run-of-the-mill from you know who knows where um, power supply which is 5 volts at 5 amps and this is the this is the this is the actual power supply then this box right here is just the unit that has the um, uh, the the transformer and the electronics in it and then uh, and then the two together make up the uh, the unit as, as a whole. So, so it brings out the complete power supply functionality. But obviously I can talk about pulse width modification or modulation, I can talk about chopper circuits, I can talk about everything, but um, let's flip over to composite here and we will see <coughs> if there we go. And so let's see if it searches and it finds the unit, which I'm hoping I got it plugged in. Well there's no signal so you okay hold on here. Let me see the if it's. Cable oh, the yellow cable isn't plugged in? No, the white one's plugged in. Now hold on here. Well, we tested it. Yeah, we did. Well, it, see, I did all this work, and then it was working when we started the demo, and now it's having technical Is difficulties. It the, uh, what does it comply on here? Let me plug everything in. We'll edit this out. Well, it's going to be a dismal failure, isn't it? So. You have a video cable on the 64 that's not plugged into the projector? Yep, I have the, the video cable plugged in. Let me see. Red, I thought. No, well, I mean, we actually, have saw, we actually plugged it in at work before the show. Yep. I suppose I should have showed you guys the thing at the beginning because I can't seem to get it plugged in. Try the, the, try the composite button again. Make sure that it, you know it says composite if there's moving. Yep. Switch away and switch back. Well, it appears we have some more work to do, right? <laughs> but I have been testing the unit and. Um, the unit is, is working on the, uh, obviously it's not up and running right now, but obviously the unit has been working and generating voltages from the, for the 64. The big problem right now is making sure that there's no video or sound artifacts in the unit. So once that's completed, then we should be able to get to a point where the unit can be turned into a production unit. And uh, like I said, part of it is making a fail safe. So <coughs> obviously I wish it would figure out how to go because I'd like to show it off to you all. No, no, no. Red on the connector is, is uh, chroma. Not on a four panel. Four loads. Yeah, that's a four. White. Or that's five panel. Those are five. Yeah, it's five panel. Yeah. We saw it. I've been on the other end. I'm missing. Oh, we four. saw the red screen. Huh? I know. We saw the we saw the blue screen. We know it works. Yeah, Unplug it. Stick compro? it to your tongue and see if it's on. <laughs> no, I am not doing that. <laughs> Only five amps. Not doing that. Only five amps. Are you, mi are you right? missing a power LED? So you know you yeah, I am. Yeah. Yeah. I see. That would be the thing. I just drug this in here because it was one of the units that was on the bench. So I saw it. I can vouch for it. <laughs> <laughs> it well, anyway, um, we are working on it, and so I guess the unit. The unit is, this is the unit right here, so I'll just take it off and show everybody. This is the unit right here. So it's basically it takes 5 volt on the inside, and then it takes, and obviously the one of the big challenges right now is how to build this cable, right? I mean, if you're, you know, wanting to manufacture, because the 64 cable is not so bad because it's just a regular uh, DIN connector. But the 128 one is a real challenge because I'm not sure where those are sourced at. So that may be a little bit more challenging. I hate to go to a scenario where people need to chop off their 128 cables and send them in because that, that just doesn't sound very professional. I found professional. somebody who could make them about a year ago. I'll see if I can find those. Records. Yeah, that would be good. You had to buy you know, a thousand of them. Well, you know, a thousand of them, that'd be okay. Because I think if you get to a point where this would be useful, then, huh? A lot of use for people always need Yeah, that's the thing. So I think... Uh, uh, 
obviously, I think the, um, you know, I think the unit has a lot. The, one of the things that I know a lot of people are online, if you look at the forums and whatnot, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is a lot of folks are saying, well, why don't, why go to all this trouble? Why not just, um, why not just create a, oh, oh there, there it goes. goes. There it is. So, hey. okay, so, yeah, it works. Oh, yeah, goodness. <laughs> like, make a liar out of me. I know it works. Maybe we got a loose connection to this one. Yeah, I must have. Yeah, just for effect, right? Um, and I don't have the sound hooked up here, obviously, I don't have speakers, but there's no hum. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty clean output, and so we're obviously doing, you know, doing some more testing. This is the first prototype unit. Bill shipped it to me the other day. And I, I feel like I'm doing all the talking, but I don't want to minimize Bill's contribution. He's the one that created the principal <coughs> board, and he's the one really that came up with the, the main idea. My contribution's basically been on creating the, um, uh, creating some of that pulse width mod modulation and, and some of the microcontroller chopper circuit, because the original circuit he had was more of a, of a um, just a inverter, kind of a TTL type circuit, and it was gonna take tuning in order to get between 50 and 60 hertz and whatnot. I wanted something that was a little bit easier to manufacture and, and configure, you know, because this is gonna have to go to overseas locations as well as US locations. And I really wanted something that people could just either pull a jumper out or put a jumper on or something like that, right? Now you made a comment that there there was some, some concern about artifacts. Have you seen the problem? I, mean, I, ha I had that problem today, so it's of particular interest. You know? Yeah, uh, on this particular unit, as it stands right now, no. But during some initial testing, oh yeah. When I first, when I wasn't getting, when I realized, like I talked earlier about the fact that you had to get up to this voltage. Yeah. You know, you're wanting nine volt, but you basically have to generate 28 volts peak to peak. Peak, peak. So initially, jo uh, Bill has been the one. Really, th this is one of the main things. Bill has been working with a transformer manufacturer to create this transformer. So this is a custom transformer that he specified. Specified this transformer to do that isolation. I was going to ask about one. that. If, yeah. If he hand wrapped. No, he didn't hand wrap it. But, but from the looks of it, somebody hand wrapped it. So somebody fingers. overseas made this special for him. So he specified this transformer, and initially he sent a batch of them for me to test with that generated like 20 volts peak to peak or something. And so when I turned on the, you know, I got it all set up and I turned on the 64, oh man, the sound, the, 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 the buzzing was deafening, right? <laughs> so when you don't generate enough voltage for like the SID chip or, the, or whatever the, the systems are inside that need that additional voltage, they do not like it at all. And it shows up in the audio uh, very, very bad. In fact, got down to a certain point where the, it wouldn't even kick on. The voltage was low enough that it didn't, it just didn't even have enough to, to actually power the machine. It was enough voltage, or enough uh, amperage, but not enough voltage, right? So, in any event, uh, in this particular version, I haven't seen any, but I'll be honest with you, I haven't done extensive testing right now. I, the show was, was here, and this was the time, and so this is where we are right now. Um, but anyway, one of the things, I'll, 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 uh, I'll take questions in a minute, but one of the things I wanted to point out on this is, Sometimes I'm online, and, and you'll see in the forums, because I've been posting about my progress on this in the forums, a number of people saying, why are you bothering to do this? Why not just get a linear power supply and go, right? Just, mm -hmm. just do this, right? Just, just, just buy a linear power supply and go. Well, there's two problems. One is, if you do the power supply part, then you're responsible, if you're a manufacturer, you're responsible for the UL testing and everything. That's not a cheap opposition. The other one is, I feel like this design is more useful, because when you get done with this design, you could physically power a 64 from a battery, right? Generate five volt DC, mm -hmm. have fun, right? Whereas with a linear power supply, you're basically just converting the AC voltage that you're getting from the line. So you're not actually, you're not actually freeing yourself from the line. You're just, you're just kind of massaging the, the line of, voltage into something a little lower for the Commodore to use. Think of solar powered uh, Commodore. That's right, it could. Well, and they just, uh, last weekend, a whole, I don't know if there's, well, yeah, Leaf is here, and, and some folks, Ian, you guys went to the Occupy uh, Starbucks or whatever, you guys brought your SXs and whatnot, you know, and here you are probably trying to find a cord so you can plug it in. Of course, an SX, I'm not sure you'll ever have to yeah. have a huge battery bank to power an SX, but but still, you could, you know, go somewhere and kind of have that kind of, you know, interesting deal and say, well, no, I don't actually need a, I don't need a, you know, plug in the wall or whatever. I can use this. I'm thinking more of people that want to uh, have one, like you want to go somewhere and you want it to be portable or you just, you just generally want to do this idea of having it not rely on that voltage for whatever reason. Like a while back, a long time ago, I had a, I was, de I was designing a, an actual robot that had a counter 64 as the guts, as the as the brains. Well, that's kind of difficult to do that when 
you gotta, you know, gotta tether a cord around. <laughs> okay, come here, little robot, and make sure you gather your cord up behind you, right? So, in any event, I just feel like this gives you primarily the idea of using a switch mode power supply, but also gives you the opportunity, if you so desire, to power off of non uh, non line non mains voltages. So, solar panels, batteries, whatever, right? And just a button. Bicycles. Yeah, you know, the, the final, I probably won't have a button because I don't think people will change it that often, but there'll probably be a way to, like, open it up and change a jumper to go between 50 and 60. And the other one is, like, this power supply right here, this power supply is 110, 220. Like, it'll work in both, it, it's, it's like one, it's like a universal power supply, 100 to 250 volts, all is the same from that perspective. So it makes it a little easier. You don't have to design a unit for the European market and a unit for the or a unit for the 220 crowd and a unit for the 110 crowd, or a unit for the, you know, I think there's some scenarios that are 110, 50, and then there's 110, 60, and then there's 220, 50. I don't know if there's, I don't think there's 220, 60, but there's all these different variations, and you don't have to worry about manufacturing different options. You just, here you go. There's one option that works for all scenarios. And since you're not plugging in the wall, then you don't, that's why you don't need any kind of UL. That's right. I mean, it would, I mean, obviously, everything, you know, they'd love for you to get UL on everything, but I, personally, I feel like I'm much more comfortable with, if I were buying something like this, I'd be much more comfortable buying it when I say, oh, yeah, I'm converting five volts to something, as opposed to, voltage. yeah, you're starting with a low voltage, so you're, you know, you're kind of, your box is here, whereas if you're starting from the line, you know, I mean, that's some, that's some serious voltage hanging out there in the line, so if somebody accidentally, you know, solder something wrong, or there's a trace that's a little marginal or whatever, you could end up with a fire, and, you know, that's, I, I just feel like there's a little bit more liability there. That or worse, a ruined Commodore. I know, really, yeah. A burnt Commodore, that would be the worst, no, right? No, we don't care. Yeah. We don't work Commodore. So, no, that's not to say that, you know, in the end, this might need to get some sort of certification, but I just feel more comfortable with the idea of letting somebody who does power supply design for a living do the power supply design. And the only thing this is doing is just massaging some some voltages back up to use for the Commodore. So, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Current enough for like a super CPU and a RAM? It can be. Um, the specification was to make sure that it had enough power to, to power an REU, which tends to be the most heavy user. So the we were the, talking about that the, with somebody. What is the? Do you remember the current? What the current is with that? Four point three amps. Well, that's what the that's what the power supply came up, but that doesn't, doesn't draw that, does it? The REU, no, but the REU draws. Um, I mean, I could put a ammeter on it and figure out exactly what it draws, but I bet it draws. I bet it draws an amp and a half by itself. I was. That's why I was thinking it was two and a half with the C sixty. That's yeah. all on the five volt side. It is on the five volt side. Yeah. None of this is on this. So the key there is you just need to make sure that you have plenty of five volt margin to generate this the nine volt leftover. Leftover, right? Because what you have is if you have if you have four point three amps of five volt and typically the power supplies the Commodore provided did one volt amp or it didn't they called it uh, one VA or sorry nine VA which is nine volt amps which essentially is nine watts. So it's one amp essentially at nine volt RMS. Um, so that's another amp of nine volt power you need. But you gotta remember your step you you know there's conservation of energy here. So yeah. if you're stepping up the voltage, you're losing half the amperage. Right? So double the voltage, half the amperage. So basically you're going from ten to let's say thirty. So you're basically three times the voltage, so you get one third the amperage. So in order to generate one amp at nine volt AC really need an additional three amps of five volt power plus a little bit of margin so I've been trying to specify a 10 amp uh, five volt power supply that would give you plenty of effort and that would give you three maybe three and a half amps for the nine volt side and then an, like six amps for the for the uh, five volt side at least a seven and a half amp Power are, you gonna, are you going to pass the five volts directly through, or are you going to have some type of like filtering or, or, <clears throat> or monitoring on the five volt side also? Well, see, that's the thing. If you if there, that's that's two things that we could do. One is well, because I'm I'm having a little bit of challenge finding ten amp five volt power supply. So that's a little bit of a challenge, and they get a little expensive. So another option is to use like a nine volt or seven volt or something a little bit higher that's got you know a little bit more voltage. Then obviously, what you do there is you, you'd actually bring it down to five volts in the box, 
and then you could do monitoring there and, and check for shorts and stuff like that. But right now, this unit just passes the five volts directly through. <clears throat> and that would be the easiest approach, again, if the power supply will generate the five, I mean, you could monitor the five volts there. That not be that would not be a problem. But as far as having to further generate voltages, that it would be preferable not to do that. You kind of the keep it simple, stupid approach. Yeah, quite a lot. So just like you know, some things like that. Yeah. Well, and you can you can do that. Yeah, you can do that in the power supply. So the big thing is getting it to the point where you've got enough in it, but it's not like the Taj Mahal power supplies. I mean, you know. It, can end up with a hundred dollars worth of power supply. What have you? Point, you know, three point seven amps or four point. And that would work. You know, you, Ninety or, or hundred twenty watt power supply. And you can, you can do that. But the key is, is I looked at that, and so you could use. I mean, you can get those power supplies too. But I, I kid you not, you can buy any, pretty much any voltage you want. I mean, the only problem I'm running into right now is making sure that I, there's a supplier that can generate the amperage that I need. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can use the 19 volt or the 28 volt or whatever those power supplies are. The key is then you're then you're in charge of generating the five volts. Right. And to understand that you're not generating one amp at five volts, you're generating up to five amps at five volts, which right. is a sick. I mean, there's a big heat sink and there's some circuitry. Typically, you'd want to do a switched mode regulation there, and so you got some stuff that you got to do there. So it's just more complexity. You had a question. Yeah, I got answered. Oh, that okay. Was, uh, okay. Same thing. So it works as it as it was trying to prove me wrong, but it works. Must be a video connection or whatnot. But anyway, and I, like I said, I don't have the sound, but we can. I mean, I, I have the unit at my de or at my table, and so if you want to take it and try it out <laughs> with something that's got sound, what I've been doing to test initially is to turn like a 1702 and just turn it all the way up as loud as I can get it, and then power it on and see what kind of artifacts are there. It's not scientific. I need to get a, a signal noise. I kind of need to get some bench equipment to actually test what the harmonics are and whatnot. And I haven't gotten that done yet. So I'm not, this is not imminently ready for production, but at least it's to the point where we know it works and uh, and we can carry the idea forward. So hopefully, you know, I think the idea is Bill's going to get it. Um, Bill is probably going to get it finished. And, you know, there might be, I might have some additional contributions, but primarily this is really Bill's project and then I think he's going to probably uh, sell a bulk to someone like myself or if Joe's around, I don't, Joe's not probably in here, but you know various resellers who want to offer it to the public, he'll sell kind of wholesale to those individuals and then they can sell individual power supply units to, to various people. <clears throat> not as yet, but there's not much in it. Like I said, it's, it's basically just one, two, three, four, maybe six components on the board. So it's not, I mean, right now, it's so not very... the cost is going to be the, the five-volt supply? Um, no, actually, that five-volt supply was only like, it seems to me like it was $7 or something like that. It was not much at all. I'm in thrift stores. Yeah, it's, it's really cheap. Everywhere. So, I, you know, I, I, I would, I, I don't really want to hazard a guess yet because I don't want to get people's hopes up by setting the number too low. But we're trying to make it as economical as possible. I mean, the idea is to get it ready to go, and so people just, it's a no-brainer. It's like, you know what, Jim, I'm going to just buy three or four power supplies and, 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 and outfit my entire thing, as opposed to, ooh, I don't know, maybe I should continue to see if I can get a few more years out of our, my, linear, my old linear power supplies. Until then, though, you know, a plug for Kevin here. He's rebuilding power supplies, so you, could, you, can, you can go down that route at, at this point until we get a little further along, along the line. So are you considering having multiple output for, say, powering two or three devices at the same time through the same power to the No, like that? Um, no. Is that because, because the 5 volts got generated through your supply? Well, you can always put more there, but, you know, what I've found there, you're, the problem is what you're doing there is then you're not you're losing isolation between two units, yeah. right? So if you have a disk drive and you have a, power, and you have a Commodore 64, and so now you don't have any isolation between the two units, but they have a they have a ground, so they have a ground path through the power supply, and they have a ground path through like the IEC cable. So then you have what you call ground, ground loops. loops, and then you have then you potentially have a noise problem. And so I just is it possible to do? Yeah. This is something I think is something I want to do because yeah. I know what I'll, extra cables. Yeah, yeah, it would be extra cables. The, the yeah the idea is that. You know, we want this to be something that the base box, you just purchase, you know, the, purchase the box with the 
to board and whatever. And then we have somebody, you know, somebody would make the cables, like either for a 128 or 64, but they plug in at the same spot. So you just you know, plug them in, put the cable in, put it together, and send it out. Depending right. on the answer, you might be able to do the opposite. You may be able to power four or five of those off like one big yeah. five volt, like a big PC power supply. Yeah, or something. you could. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. And if you if you want to do that, go right ahead. Have fun. <laughs> but when you call and say, "Hey, I got a ground loop or whatever," I'm like, uh, did you did you do one power supply to one converter? <laughs> no. Okay, do that and call me back. Right. <laughs> one more question uh, for me at least. Um, no, I, I, you're covering the the, the sixty four. Uh, there with the, with the plug. Now, one of the problems that I've always had is the 128D, the power supply that's in that. Mm -hmm. What are what are the possibilities? Like just skipping the whole, you know, uh, ground plug going into the here or that ground plug, uh, the wall plug going into the the, the back of the, the 128D, and then mounting something like this in there to power it. What are the what are the chances of that? I think the circuit here could be retrofitted into 120 like that. The power supply yeah. thing right there. You just maybe take that circuit board out. And you just replace it with something that has that on it right there. And it would be driving the, the, the 1571 in there. Yep. And uh, whatever else. Yeah, because that, but the rest of those voltages are, that's yeah, a 12 volt DC, 5 volt DC. Right. For the, for the drive and the red I think that's possible. I think the key, though, is um, that one is, you know, there's a decision as to be made. Do you, you know, do you, do you use, the, do you get it from main? You know, do you, do you use the, the 110, 220? plug that's on the back or do you do you go with something lower you know probably there might be more comfort level since that is inside the unit then that doesn't necessarily have the same you know that's a component of, a, of a, another unit so you don't typically you may test it but you don't get UL certified on an individual component you get UL certified on the unit as a whole so if you if you were to design something like that that might and it's in a metal case and stuff so that might be um, a little bit, you know, even more comfort level there, even dealing with mains voltage right there. Um, or you could say, you know what, I'm just going to put a plug right there for that's 12 volts. Just for heat, too, yeah. to get the heat out of that 128. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I was say, you know, that's not as urgent with the D because those are still available. You can still buy those new. Really? Those power supplies? Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. I didn't know that. Hook the man up. I don't, I don't know about the vendor, but I got 10 of them. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know where, I don't remember the vendor where I, I bought them. I think it was on them. Lemon that was supposed to sell them yeah. on yeah. eBay. Yeah, there's, so, yeah. there's a vendor that still sells them, and they, they, they're they actually common or labeled. Someone's everything. got a warehouse. So, yeah, they may. Yeah. They may. But I don't see that as a problem. I think it's primarily, it's probably the the scenario would be gaining, gaining comfort level that this works and is in there, and everybody's happy with it, and then maybe looking at just creating a new circuit board that has whatever is necessary to do all the 128D yeah. all on one board and use whatever is these components necessary to, to do that. Because you could put a, what you could do on that easy is to create a, a 12 5 volt switch mode power supply as a, they sell it as a module, you could buy it as a module and just you put it on the board and so then you got 12 volts, 5 volts coming out and then you just put another one of these circuits right there and you're done, and you can fit it all on that board, and then you're done. But you still outsource the power supply. The power supply part right. is somebody else. You're just doing voltage conversion at that point. Still, you're still just doing voltage conversion. So we have no commie left behind. Yeah, that's right. The big thing right now, I'll be honest with you, the thing I'm most concerned about, and no, I, I'll look to you, the thing I'm most concerned about, and I believe Bill is concerned about as well, is the square connectors for the plus four and the 128. It's just it's a it's a difficult connector. Well, the plus so. four is a plastic connector. Outside that. Yeah. Well, it is. Is, is that the, the same plug? I can't remember. Uh, same plug, but I don't think the pinout is the same. Yeah. yeah. Right. It would oh, be. Boy. The oh, plus definitely. four is four pins. It's been about three or four years, but there was somebody who would make them. I think huh? the pins are. It's been about three or four years, but there was somebody. I, mean, I actually talked to the manufacturer, and they said they would make them. Okay, but I, I'll, I'll see what I can find and send yeah. it to you. Like I said, that's mainly, everything else about this is commodity. It's just those special connectors. Mm -hmm. And I really think, in general, that's becoming probably the most difficult part of generating new hardware for the older platforms is the connectors. Mm -hmm. Like the SIO connectors for the Atari, the, the, this power connector and whatnot. You know, everybody may have made those connectors back in the day, but now... There's not a whole lot of demand for them, so the number of people making those connectors is dwindled considerably. With this being a small, pretty small unit, well, we got that big transformer. Yeah, never mind. What? I think just 
sell a kit where you can just solder it, you know, lines right into the board, <laughs> yeah, stick the connector. No, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I, kits have, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I, I've sell. done kits. No, they sell well, but the problem is, you know, and I'll just kind of put on my, you know, proprietor 101 hat or whatever you want to call it. You, you sell a kit and people want it to be cheaper than the finished product. Mm. And so you sell it, and so you don't, you know, it's like, okay, well, parts plus a little bit of markup, and there you go. Then they get it, and they, oh, yeah, I know how to solder, and they don't. Uh, so then they get it done, and it doesn't work, and then they are emailing you like 50 times saying, well, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? So instead of doing this much support on getting it to work and, like, just testing it before I ship it out and say, okay, it works, great. Okay, it doesn't, mm -hmm. toss it in the bin. Okay, it works, go. Otherwise, it doesn't, toss it in the bin. Then you spend, like, days with these uh, people. Yeah doing the support on it and I finally you're like you know what just ship it to me and I'll see if I can figure out what's wrong and then you end up with another few days trying to figure out what's wrong because you want to keep a good customer and then you end up sending back and by the time you're done you've wasted you know days on that and so kits are unless you know specifically the type of people you're going to ship a kit to and you know that they're not going to call you when it doesn't work, then which is pretty rare, <laughs> kits are just a real problem. I mean, I, I think it's a great for people who are doing kits around here. It's just I, I've had, I've had, uh, I've had so so luck with that from a customer service perspective. So I'd rather know the quality I'm delivering out the door. At least have a pretty good idea of the quality I'm delivering out the door, and uh, then then just have no idea what's going on with it when it gets out the door, and, and having to work on supporting it when it when it doesn't know what it's supposed to do, and I don't know why. Or eliminate the uh, soldering from the kit. Well, no. yeah, but I mean, how are you going to do that, right? Solderless connectors. It pretty much you do all that, and you Shut get all that done, you're going to end up with a hundred, hundred fifty dollar <laughs> kit, right? So, all right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, glad it worked. Hope you enjoyed it. Fantastic.